I would entertain a motion um, to approve the agenda this evening. So moved. And a second? A second. Okay, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. So let's move right into board dialogue. Um, the first thing that I would like to do is to thank everyone who participated in our, sur in our staff survey. Um, we were able to read all of the surveys and we really appreciate the comments. They'll, they'll be very, very helpful as we move forward. I also want to reassure you this is not uh, going to be punitive. We're just wanting to get the information so that we can make some really good decisions and we want to thank you all for that very much. The other thing I'd like to say, I want to make a point of this because I just sent off a rebate for $3 and I'm looking here and with our refinancing, we're going to save a million two hundred and sixty-two thousand nine hundred eleven. I can hardly even get that out. And I'm very, very proud of it. And Mr. Hart is always so helpful and Don, and we appreciate that very much and that's a lot more savings than a $3 coupon. <laughs> So thanks to everyone who participated in that. Anyone else? I have something. Uh, I had the privilege of attending an active shooter training at Jefferson the other day, and that information will be brought to the board at the February board meeting, but it was very, very good information for, the, for our staff members. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so... Um, communications from the audience. Let's hear from Miss Angie Winch, who has Heartland Hero this evening. Miss Winch, <laughs> you've no, changed. Uh, I am Dan Thompson. I'm the assistant principal at Lincoln Intermediate. And his, uh, Angie took ill today and asked me to uh, go through our Heartland Hero and feature teacher, which I'm honored to do. Uh, Kathy, if you would come on up. Kathy Wickman is our Heartland Hero for the month, and uh, I don't even I don't even know what to say about her. She won this award when she was at Jefferson, when she worked over at Jefferson. Uh, yet when I asked the staff, who do you think uh, has helped our building, it was just an overwhelming. It was like Kathy, of course, Aunt Kathy is who we call her. She comes to our building almost every single day. Often she stays all day. She puts in about the same amount of time as the teachers do. Uh, she is there as part of the PTG. Uh, she works with our fundraiser. She runs our fundraiser. Uh, the book sales, when we do our, our books, uh, she I'm copies. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> she, she copies, she distributes, she will do anything that you ask of her except i understand from angie you asked not to get another plaque oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh in lieu of a plaque we have a couple of gift certificates Ooh, for you, you. <laughs> Thank you that's great. and we just want you to know that we truly appreciate everything that you do I for like us helping out and i know my yeah i just i don't know what to say i just like helping but. that's right uh, again, it is Lincoln's honor and privilege to present you well, as our Heartland Hero. Thank you hero. so much. And if you Sorry, I'm nervous. Thanks for all you do. Oh, no, that's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I can't go get you on this. Okay. We can go ahead and go, can't we? Say? <laughs> Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. We'll get out of your way. Bye bye. We also, uh, this month is our month to celebrate our feature teacher. Uh, and I'd like to ask Tracy Killian to come up. Tracy is not a certified educator, but he teaches our students volumes. He teaches them how to interact with one another, uh, what's expected of them, how to care for their things as well as things that aren't theirs. Uh, as far as character education, he is an example for our students. There is not a child in Lincoln who does not know Tracy. <laughs> and they all love him. 
And Tracy truly goes out of his way to show the students that he cares about them. Uh, he gives us a, a clean, safe place. He's always fixing something, usually because the kids broke it. <laughs> but, but he doesn't complain about it. He's just like, all right, I'm, I'm heading down that way. Uh, cell phone, radio, Tracy's always there. And he fixes our things, and he keeps our place looking sharp. And the kids know that he cares about them. Uh, so like I said, uh, not a certified staff or a certified educator, but truly a teacher for our kids. And is that why uh, the teachers again overwhelmingly selected Tracy Killian as our future teacher. Thank you. I'll just read a little email I sent out to the staff. Stand back there, please. As a teacher. Oh, you're fine. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's exactly what I need, camera time. Anyway, I sent out an email after I found out that uh, I was selected for feature teacher, which kind of really blew me away. Uh, but I sent out an email to all the staff. I, I just said, uh, I would like to say thanks to all who voted for me for feature teacher. It really means a lot to be recognized and appreciated and to be part of wonderful people to work with. When you work within the school system, you see the sacrifices that are made, the caring compassion that is shown each and every day by people like yourself, and for that, I'm the lucky one. So, anyway, I'm really honored. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Tracy, thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. I can leave now. <laughs> All right. Hey, Mr. Rawson, you have the featured staff member yeah. this month? Yes, I do. I have the, the honor and the privilege to be here tonight and to present the classification staff of the month of January. And that person is um, one of our cafeteria ladies. Sometimes they go below the radar and they don't. They don't realize how important they are to us, and they are, and, and sometimes they don't get recognized as much as they should. But I'd like for Donna Abnathy to come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Had she known she was going to be selected, it probably would have I wouldn't have been here. <laughs> I don't to bring you in here. But, no, I wouldn't have been. <laughs> Donna Abnathy um, has been here uh, just a little bit longer than I have, and. Um, 27 and a half years to be that, and this might, in September she'll be. Stephanie's right behind you. Now in front of you. There you go. Um, and uh, Donna has worked uh, all those years of working in Franklin, and and um, she's been a good asset, asset to working in Franklin. Um, like I said, Donna's been here longer than, than I have, and she's worked for uh, several supervisors. Uh, some of those, Dottie Bott, Dottie might be here other than she's in Florida right now. Um, Howard Hayne, and Helen Duncan, and Charlie Carlton, to name a few. Um, like I said, Donna's been here longer than I have, so I had to look at her working files. And, uh, I've worked with her for four years now about it. But I had looked I looked at her working file and and some of the things that her previous supervisor said um, in her file was uh, she had good working knowledge of the kitchen. And Donna truly does and she's uh, an excellent cook and she has good skills there. And um, one of the one of the other things was that she promotes goodwill and then another one always does a great, a good job, very dependable with another one. And um, Donna takes pride in her work with another one. And she works well with other staff, plus the students are come first. But the one note that I read that, that really I thought was great about Donna was that Donna is a very sensitive, soft-hearted, and a caring individual that works to do whatever it needed to help others. And um, that was said eight years into her career with the, depart with, or, with the um, school district. Um, and I can honestly say that um, that's still true of Donna 20 years later after that comment was written. And um, uh, the school, school district can be proud of uh, hard working, dedicated staff like, like Donna Abernathy. Um, Donna, it's a pleasure to work with you. 
in to present you this award. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, I present uh, January Employee of the Classification Employee of the Month, Don Abernathy. voices this evening? No. Okay. All right, then let's move on to the CTA report, Mr. Farrell. At our last meeting, we had, we had the chance to discuss some ways that CTA could uh, fund and support some causes from our local district and our local community through uh, the money that's raised through our gene fundraisers in each building. Some things we want to take into consideration, we're looking at the areas that we already support on an annual basis. Uh, also look at leaving flexibility for the building administrators in meeting needs for their own building. But also look at how we can continue funding and supporting caring communities, which we've now expanded to call friends and family, to support and help students in need and families in need in our district, whether that's an illness or things that, that we can help them out with. So through this, we've set up a calendar for this money that comes in from the buildings each month for teachers uh, paying so they can wear some jeans and dress down. And uh, we are going to continue to support our um, the Heart Association through the Heart Walk that we do in September. We're going to support Seasons of Hope. We'll be supporting our backpack program, which is now a year-long program. We're really excited to maybe look at how we can put some backpacks uh, in students' hands in the summer as well as in the winter. Uh, we're also going to continue to support Special Olympics in the spring. We're going to give building, uh, each building a choice for two months to be able to support needs in their buildings. And then we're also going to be putting two months into our friends and family fund so that we can help students and families in need uh, on an immediate basis because we'll have that fund there available to them. So we're really excited to be able to have this opportunity to support uh, the local community in various causes with this money. Uh, and then last but not least, I wanted to give you guys a big thanks on behalf of CTA for board appreciation. We really appreciate everything you guys do for us. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ron. That sounds like a lot of good stuff for kids. Okay, so Dr. Thomas. Okay, I want to start off by announcing our board candidates. We have Ms. Joan Sullivan, who uh, is a board candidate, and also Mr. Kerry Noble. Because we only have two candidates and two seats open, we will not be having an election, um, but we will be progressing and preparing to welcome two new board uh, members in. And we want to thank Mr. Harrington and Dr. Roethlisberger. I know you'll continue to serve with integrity and energy for the rest of your time, right? <laughs> also, I'd like to um, yeah, yes. <laughs> also like to recognize the um, administration and all of the staff for the Professional Development Day on January 7th. I think one of the hallmarks um, that our district is, is now known for is that we're all in this together, whether it's food service, whether it's a custodian, whether it's transportation teachers, uh, in all the areas of the school. And we had an all-district professional development day on the 7th. What was really exciting was the table work that happened and the, the thought processes that are going in to cross-thinking um, and integrative thinking around preparing for the Common Core Standards. And I really want to commend the planning process that went by. We had table leaders, we had staff highly engaged, and I think that we're well on our way to having every single employee understand the transition that we're making towards that Common Core Standard and those expectations that we have so that our students can be successful. So I want to thank everybody for their participation. I know the first day back from winter break professional development is not necessarily um, what people are looking for, but I think it was a great opportunity for us to come together to hear financial updates, to hear about some of our technology pieces. Uh, and we also really appreciate the fact that Mrs. Howard was able to join us on that particular day. So just want to thank everybody for that. Sounds good. And in the vein of saving money, since we're not, as you two pointed out, since we're not running an election, it'll save us a little money. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, down to information items. Um, Sarah and Ron, you guys have some information for our Teacher of the Year selection. So we're looking at uh, changing our Teacher of the Year nomination process uh, in order to 
uh, maybe put some more weight or uh, to better congratulate our teachers from each building and, uh, and show them how proud we are of them, but also to better align ourselves for our district teacher of the year with the state nomination so that our district teacher of the year can go on to the state competition and have a chance to become the Missouri teacher of the year, which if they win, they get to go to Washington and the White House and it's, it's a nice honor. So we're looking at how we can better uh, or progress the honor that we give to our teachers. Uh, this process will start in March with nomination forms that will go out to each building and the buildings will choose a teacher of the year for their building, uh, much like our feature teacher. And then those teacher of the year from each building will have a luncheon and at that luncheon we'll then choose from that pool of teachers our district teacher of the year. And we'll have a set criteria for that with a committee that will choose that teacher. Uh, that teacher of the year for the district will then have the opportunity to move on to the state program. The, uh, the nice thing about it as well those teachers from each building that are teacher of the year that are uh, honored at that luncheon, they will be the feature teacher for each building the following year. So they will come in front of you as, as they usually do and, and still be honored here. But uh, that will give us a chance to have a luncheon for them and, and honor them again and really show how proud we are of them. So I think it's a really good process and uh, I think the, the teachers will really like it as well. Our goal is that we have such excellent teachers that every chance we have to really feature them and let other people know what a great job they do. This should be able to enhance that process by really looking at each individual individual building and that selection and what they bring to the table as well as the overall district teacher of the year. Okay. Any questions? Thanks, great. Guys. Thank you. Okay, so um, we need a uh, Common Core Standards update from Sarah, Roblin, and Katie. We're, we're back. The Supreme. <laughs> well, we uh, heard from you all initially that you weren't interested in doing mathematics first. So we're yeah. finally to mathematics. <laughs> uh, and uh, as you all know, we've kind of realigned how our ICCs work, and Robin has taken the lead on the assessment piece. And Kim is taking the lead on the instructional piece, and she kind of works more, more with mathematics. Roblin works a lot with mathematics and is actually doing some Common Core work at the national level on reviewing mathematics uh, items. But we just kind of wanted to give you a feel for how those things are changing, just as we did with the uh, ELA or language arts last time. And I'll point out one more time that this was the conversation on May the on uh, January the seventh when we met together as a district staff. We looked at actual assessment items in both language arts and in mathematics, and then we also looked at what literacy is going to look like in science and social studies, and then we looked at what our Encore teachers need to know about Common Core. With that in mind, we asked each teacher to give us an idea of where they were as they exited that professional development, and then also part of their evaluation was what do they think the district needs to do next. So we're evaluating those results, which will also help us as we proceed. So I'm going to turn it over to Kim, and she's going to talk a little bit about the overall shifts, and then they're going to give you a couple of assessment items. So get ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, just the the colored sheet. That's the uh, just a slide that we shared with the um, whole district at the January 7th meeting, and there we talked about some of those. Uh, there's really three three big shifts in the math. One is um, the focus of math. They have identified, you know, the uh, um, GLEs, they always said, were a mile wide and an inch deep, and kids were learning individual skills and things like that, um, and not seeing the connectedness of it. Well, they've identified some critical focus areas, and if you don't refer to you to the green sheet, that is, that they've identified the critical focus areas for grades K through 8, and then on the other side is the um, content areas for high school. Um, and so they, they, what they're really saying is that all the, the standards that we have out there, these are the ones that are really important for kids to know. So they've kind of narrowed it down somewhat for us as far as identifying those critical focus areas. And then that, you know, we spoke, uh, spoke a little bit about that cohesiveness and the coherence of the mathematics. The, the mathematicians understand and they see how math connects, but what, what you learn one in uh, one area connects to learning in another area. But a lot of times we as teachers and kids, we were teaching so many individual isolated skills and we were helping kids to see how those skills were connected and how what they learned in one year will help them to understand things in another, uh, in another year or in another um, uh, part of the mathematics. 
And so they've really paid a lot of attention to the sequencing of those standards and, and how we actually are uh, presenting and teaching those standards to the students. And the last um, shift is a rigor. And rigor, you know, the big thing we did, I was in Cape today and we were talking about the rigor. You know, rigor is not necessarily in the standards, but it comes in the classroom and it's the high expectations that teachers will have and getting that deep conceptual understanding of mathematics and not just getting the right answers, but really understanding and actually, and actually being able to communicate that understanding of, of their, their, the student's understanding of the mathematics. So that's, um, those are the three main shifts um, that have to do with um, with mathematics. And the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is you're going to hear a lot about these eight mathematical practices. And they're also on the green sheet. They're on the, uh, the kindergarten through eight side. The first um, little box there, it says the um, K-12 standards of mathematical practices. These are not um, grade specific, but these are the processes and the procedures that students will use to to um, use mathematics and to learn mathematics and to apply mathematics to real world situations. And so you'll hear a lot about those. Those aren't, like I said, those aren't a standard. They're uh, in addition to the standards. Okay. And I think that's. Um, we have two sample assessments for you. Um, I've been privileged, I don't know, sometimes cursed. Um, to work with the Smarter Balance Consortium myself, I am actually reviewing uh, middle and high school items. So I get an assignment from them, I go online, I look at every single one of the items that, make, is, that they send me and see if it matches up to the standard. I have to work them all out. I am learning math I forgot about. <laughs> I'm just saying it's been interesting. Um, but one of the things that, one of the, one of the, the I guess threads that I see through the whole thing is the importance of being able to communicate and also the ratcheting up of skills. So for example, uh, you have you have you have a, a one pager and on one side you have a shaded diagram. And on that diagram you see what, what, what the kids have to do is they have to use an online protractor. So not just the protractor you used in the classroom, if you remember those, but they're actually online measuring out the angle. Um, and then they have to put that in there. And then at the bottom, you notice they actually have to use pictures, numbers, and words to show how they measure that angle. So it's not good enough to just get the answer. They have to be able to communicate how. And it's not just about communicating in words. They can use numbers. They can use diagrams. Anything that they can to communicate what they were thinking mathematically. This is a fourth grade item. Which is kind of scary because in our current GLEs, um, measure, the, the actual measurement of an angle is a, is a little bit higher grade level, um, sixth and seventh. Okay? Actually having to communicate what that process looks like is not even measured. Right. Okay, so so you began to see how that that transitional skills are re, are going to become so important, um, and why it's important to really look vertically and work together as as department. That's kind of why Kim and I are looking at shifting our responsibilities a little bit so that that coherence and and vertical piece gets put in there. Um, on the back side, um, it looks it looks so much easier because there's. There's no square, there's no no anything, but in, and in fact, this is an eighth grade item, and I, I would almost guarantee that the majority of you probably did something like this when you were in high school in geometry, but it's an eighth grade item, and basically it is a proof, only it's just not one of those formal proofs where you have to do the lines and you have to, you have to get everything lined up. Uh, basically, the, the students are given a statement, and they have to develop a chain of reasoning to justify or refute the conjecture that was made in that statement. Um, then it goes on to tell them that they can include a graph. Um, I always say if it tells you you could include a graph, <laughs> that you probably want to include a graph. Um, and, and it even tells them you know, how to do that. Put your cursor here and do that. So, so again, I wanted you to see that technology piece that's coming into play again. Uh, the protractor in one, the graph in the other. Um, and so a couple of things that I want to point out on here, you probably notice the vocabulary. Conjecture, refute, chain of reasoning. Okay. Uh, Y-axis, 
x-axis coordinate or vertices corresponding vertices these are these are this is vocabulary that we have to be sure that is being used vertically in our district so one of the things that we're going to be that, that we have already started on and will continue to work on is a a district vocabulary piece that we share district wide so it's not just the math teacher talking about this but the science teacher is too the technology teacher is too uh, when we have an opportunity to talk about um, any type of angles that that's right. being discussed and those words are being used um, and it's not just that but it's also the assessment piece we have to talk about words like what does it mean to refute and and that that is something that could be done in our um, English language arts classes. Um, reading that statement in and of itself is reading, remember we talked about reading um, uh, informative text at the, uh, at the last board meeting with English language arts? This is reading informational text. And so those skills that they're learning in English language arts are being used also in mathematics and vice versa. So I, I think it's really important that we begin to see how the, the whole idea behind the Common Core is how we pull everything together and make it more relevant to kids and, and, and their, their future, how, how they're going to grow and be able to communicate. Not only that, but just to relate it to real world yeah. problems. One of the problems that um, I saw in an online video um, was one of the writers of the um, Smarter Balance Assessment was talking about a, an assessment that was about at that 6th, 7th grade, eighth grade range. Anyway, they have, the students have to actually read an, an informational text, pull the numbers and information from that text, and figure, it out, figure out the problem. And the problem is that the, the article describes a company, that, a juice box company, that's having tr uh, difficulty with their straws slipping down inside of the box. And they, of course, give them the measurements and things that they need to do to solve this problem. But they actually have to write Back the, 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 to solve the problem, what they're asked, the task they're asked to do is to write back how the company can solve the problem of the straw slipping down into the juice box boxes, and it's an actual ge geometry problem. But you can see there's a lot of reading, and, and they have to pull those numbers out of the text and stuff like that to, to answer that. And I have to be real careful how I say this, but uh, the, I've been reviewing for the past two weeks uh, the performance tasks that will be on the computer that the kids will take. Um, and, and I see every single item is, is based in some type of relevant experience for the kids. In other words, they can, they can <coughs> see why that math is important. And we have, to, we have to revamp some of the things that we do so that that becomes relevant in the classroom as well. So, um, what grade level is this? Uh, the conjecture piece is eighth grade. Eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Any, any questions? Howard and I are glad we're through school. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you could chew a piece of gum and wrap it around the straw and keep that it from sliding. There you go. That's, That's what I can do instead of the math. No, knowing that the scoring guide would not allow for that. Oh, well. I still think it's pretty clever. It is clever. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Um, Mr. Farrell, Instructional Technology. So last week, along with the app, I showed you a piece of existing technology that we're using, which was our clickers. Well, this week I have a new piece of technology that we're starting to use, and it's a pin. It's called a LiveScribe pin. And we just have a few of these in the district. But what's great about this device is how inconspicuous it is. I mean, it's a pin. So if you are using this for help, uh, no, really, no one really in the class would know that you're even using it. And it is amazing what they can do with this small device. Now it does more than I have time to show you in this, or that you would want me to show you in this, uh, this board meeting tonight, but I'll tell you a few things. Uh, what's great about this, a student can write notes. Uh, maybe they're learning a quadratic formula in high school math and uh, they're writing the formula down, but they're not really good at notes. They're not a very fast writer, and so they can just get the formula down. Well, while they're writing, this pen will not only record the audio mm -hmm. that is being, uh, you know, said in the room, so with the teacher teaching the lesson, but it also records every stroke that the student makes on the paper. At a later time, that student can go back to that paper and touch anywhere, maybe on the first part of the equation, and it will play back the audio exactly where they were writing those notes. But more than that, they can then get on their computer 
and they can click on one part of that note and it will draw the notes out just as they did on the paper and give that audio as well. So you have visual, you have audio, the student can go back and just relearn the entire lesson all just with a pen and a piece of paper. Uh, it does so much more. You can, uh, keeping with the math theme, you can uh, draw irregular shapes. There's an app and it will give you the area of that shape. If you're a student who has a modification to use a calculator, but maybe you're a bit embarrassed because no one else in your class is using one, there's a piece of paper with a calculator on, just drawn on the uh, paper itself. And they can tap on the numbers with the pen and hit enter. And on the screen here, it shows the answer for their calculator. So this one pen can do so much. English language learners, they can write, there's an app that we are just going to test out in the next week. They can write out a word in Spanish and then tap on that word and it'll give them the English word on the screen as well as the translation in audio. And they can go backwards as well. They can write an English word, tap on it, and it'll give them the Spanish translation. So I have not found an end to the uses of this device yet, but uh, it is very amazing. And you know, K through 12, this pen can do a lot. And Ron, would you share with them how much it costs? Because that's amazing too. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that you connect to the computer with a wire in order to get that information to the computer is $99 for the pen. So this one that is wireless is $149, so for $50 more, and it just automatically wirelessly syncs. So pretty reasonable for what you're getting back out of it as far as accommodating individual student needs. Are we going to, if we go to, the, are we going to supply this to every student, one of these, or? Right, right now, we are using it with specific students and specific applications. You know, that's the bigger conversation, whether or not you're going to go to a one-to-one -one initiative, whether or not every student would eventually have an iPad, all those kinds of things. And that's part of that technology long-term plan. But you can envision, particularly for a student maybe who has an IEP that has difficulty in a certain area, what a boost an instrument like this would be, and again, inconspicuous, but immediate feedback that also gives the teacher additional time because they're not having to spend a lot of individualized time helping that student do some things that the pen can automatically do for them. And if you think if we have the training and the resources available in the district, you know, this is something that a student could almost fund themselves, you know, for $99. Where if you look at a tablet device or even a phone, that could be several hundred dollars, even a thousand dollars, that's a little harder. So this is something that's very realistic and it's very powerful. Uh, and then I have an app for you, a math app. This is the one I had for you last week, but uh, I wanted to make sure I stuck with what they were doing. You know, the thing about technology is, is not the device itself that engages the student. It's really the process and the way that it teaches the student. So this is teaching them long division, but what's great is it's very tactile. The student, it shows the student exactly what to do. So they're going to drag the 8 underneath the 25, and it spreads it out. Then it's going to tell them exactly what step to do next. You'll see the instructions on the bottom. So they're going to hit the plus sign. It goes in at once. It goes twice. Three times. I could go another one, but I'm already past my 25, so I'll go back. I'm going to hit the check mark. And it tells me the next step. I need to drag the 6 down. Now a learner that has a problem learning this on paper, by dragging the numbers, it's adding another step, and they can really start to get a concrete understanding of how long division works and how the process works. So I'll go ahead and finish out my problem. And it dings and lets me know that I'm done. So it's a neat way of learning. And something I failed to mention last week, you know, just the fact of how I'm getting this app to display over here wirelessly is another great tool for classrooms. We don't have an iPad for every student, but if you have one iPad as a teacher and you have a $99 Apple TV device, you can wirelessly walk around the classroom, you can hand the iPad to a student and let them manipulate the device, and everything is displayed, so this becomes a whole class instructional tool rather than a one student tool. So there's some very neat, very cost effective products out there. Thank you, Ron. Ron's always so passionate about what he has to tell us about it. I appreciate that. Okay, so we're down to discussion items and we're pulling, let's see, B, D, G, and H, right? Yes. Okay, so that means that I'm down to... You probably don't need to discuss the bills, it's probably yeah. just for the motions. Right, right. So it's really... Okay, so, but I need a separate motion. Right. Right, okay. No. We're going to discuss D, G, and H. Okay. All right, so any discussion? We don't need to discuss B. Got that figured out. Any discussion on uh, D? 
So this is some additional information. Thank you. I don't need one. This is the same stuff as emailed. Okay, this th we got this on yeah yesterday. Yeah, for okay. just so if they looked at it, they know it's not any different. Okay. I'd like to put this on a 30-day review because if, I just got this information last night at 9 o'clock and I really didn't have time to study it as well as what I wanted to. And I, I, I don't want to make a decision on something so important that it not be correct. If, <clears throat> if everybody else is in agreement. You're making that in a form of motion? Yes, that's a motion. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. So there's a motion. Got your second. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. All right. Uh, consideration of the architectural project management and engineering for the FEMA project. <coughs> Item G. Discussion. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee that, that worked on that and brought the recommendation to us at the last meeting. Um, I know you put a lot of time and effort into that because I was here uh, when you went through that. Uh, but we had, had some reasons why we chose to, uh, to pull that off and, uh, and to do some things different. And... Uh, we're just in the discussion part of that now as, as far as we'll be pulling that off and working on that later as far as what we're going to want to do with that. But I do appreciate your effort, and I, I just see it as a, such a big magnitude for the district, even though it's just a FEMA project now that may be 4 or $5 million. Uh, it's very possible that that might be uh, who we work with in the future uh, because we don't have a firm that we've worked with for a long time. For, for any length of time now so and that you know the possibility of having a bond issue and maybe having 20 to 30 million dollars to work with that decision probably needs to rest up here behind the table as opposed with with staff members that are just out there looking at what what architects do and uh, we probably need to do a little more homework on that so anyway that's all okay um so how about h which one? That would be the consideration of the selection process for the architectural project management and engineering for yeah. FEMA. Uh, what what a reason I wanted to pull that off um, is I would I will not like to entrust that to the staff and put that burden on you for that selection process. So that when we look at selecting uh, those firms and putting out an RFP then we will ask the board to take, to take that over and look at that and make those decisions, okay? Thank you. Okay, now, do we need a separate motion for this to the, for, to the post, or shall I? Um, you can do the rest of these, and then I would do your um, consensual items and then go back and ask for those motions. Gotcha. Okay. So let's, let's uh, move to our action items and approve the consensual items which would be A and C. B. C. Okay. C, E, E, F, and F. Right. Right? Okay. All right. So do I hear a motion to approve those items? So moved. Thank you. A second? I'll second it. Okay. All those in favor? <coughs> okay, so let's so go back and do. Sign, yeah, let's let's go back and do the approval of regular bills, except for signs, etc. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Okay, and so let's. Do I hear a motion to uh, pay signs, etc.? So, so moved. moved. Okay, and a second. I'll second. Mr. Harrington is going to abstain. All those in favor? Okay. 
Then you would make your motion to. You know, Got it. Okay. Um, I need a motion to post for the engineer and project manager for the FEMA project. You do? Uh, You're asking for a motion? I am. <laughs> would you like to would you like to make that motion, Mr. Mr. Howard? Yes. Okay. I would make a motion to post uh, for the engineering and project manager for the FEMA project. Okay, do we hear a second? I'll second it. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Now I need a motion to assign all responsibilities for the selection and contract awards for the FEMA project directly to the Board of Education. So moved. I'll second it. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposition? Okay. All right. Now, it need, it looks like I need a motion to adjourn to closed session. Okay. Okay. You want the numbers? You need yeah. the numbers. Yeah. Okay, they're right here. <laughs> would, they are right there. I would like to make a motion to go to executive <laughs> session. Look, look at that. Paragraphs 1, 3, and 13. I li okay, I like that. that okay? okay. Yes, I will. I'll suck it And we need a roll call. Hi. Yes. A. Yes. Howard. Yes. Davis. Yes. Carrington. Yes. Lawson. Yes. Roethlisberger. Yes. Thanks for coming, guys.